Hey, Celebration Church, I know you're having a great service so far, but the best is yet to come. Lori and I are speaking in Lima, Peru today, and we are grateful, though, to have in the pulpit one of our good friends, one of our church family members, John Z, as in, well, Zorro Norman, all the way from Norwich, that's Porridge, England. Soul Church is an amazing church, a leading church, and today you're going to hear a great word from a great guy. Just pray that he's not too European naughty. Hey, Celebration Church, stand to your feet and let's welcome the man all the way from Europe with some crazy blonde hair, John Norman. Well, good morning. Thank you, Pastor Joe and Laurie. Wow, what an... Just stay... Whoa, you're going down way too early there. Way too early. I just want to say thank you to Pastor Joe and Laurie. We, we're just so honored to be here today and so grateful. And um, who knows pastors need pastors? And just as Pastor Joe and Laurie are your pastors, there are pastors. My wife Chantelle is here today. And we really just love your church. We love the family here, the team here, and we're just so grateful to be here. So would you put your hands together? Come on, let's honor. I know they're down in Peru today, but let's just say a big thank you. <laughs> Greetings from England. Any Brits in the house? Give us a wave. You're a Brit. You want to be a Brit? <clears throat> a couple of British people here today, but the king sends his love. Um, he couldn't make it. Uh, one or two family problems sorted out. But he just wanted to say hi as well. We normally travel together. Um, but couldn't make... Some of you are like, do you really? No, I don't. That was a joke. I don't travel with the king anywhere. Um, but it's great to be in this, in this church today. So should we, should we pray? Do you, should we receive God's word today together? So Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come around your word. Lord, I pray that we can leave my accent to one side and that you'd speak to us today. I pray, Lord, that you would help us grow and be more like you, Jesus. We're in this leadership series, Lord. I pray that you would speak to us about specific areas we can lead with in this season. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, now you can take your seats. There we go. I want to say a special thank you to your team here, um, pastors Jacob and Daniel and Jim and all the team. Just that we, we have some of our staff here today. You guys have been investing in our staff. In fact, if you're here from Soul Church, just stand up. We just want to say, say hi to you guys. These guys have come over. And you guys have been just really enlarging us and investing in us and feeding us. Oh, my goodness. The food here is ridiculous. Do you realize how good it is? Wow. They took us to this place called Golden Corral last night. <laughs> they said they're branching out and there's budget cuts within the church. So we went to Golden Corral and it was golden. It really was special. <laughs> Pastor Daniel was so kind and so generous and just row upon row of food. And we just, just kept going back for more. And um, Don't start the clock yet. I haven't started, by the way. That's... We also, we've, just, just give us a wave if you're single. Just, if you're single, just give us a wave. Put your hand down if you're ma female. So just all the males, just, put your hand, just keep your hand up if you're single and male. male. Some of you are like, what am I? A um, couple of girls, just stand up, Izzy and Lucy. The reason I brought, <laughs> Izzy and Lucy, just stand up. They're, okay, they're single, okay? So if you're, if you're single, you love Jesus, you're a man, and you're worth a lot of money, come and speak to me afterwards, <laughs> because I can do an introduction for a small fee, and uh, yeah, you can move to Norwich, and that would be a wonderful, wonderful next chapter for your life. So Lucy, Izzy, I did my best. They asked me to do that, and <laughs> <laughs> he's enjoying that. <laughs> I, like I said, don't start the clock yet, because we haven't started speaking God's word. We only want to start the clock when the word starts. That's... <laughs> I also want to say um, thank you to Pastor Tanner and all the team from Wave Conference. We brought our daughter to Wave Conference in, uh, when was it? This year sometime. And <laughs> so I got off a plane last night. I'm very jet lagged, but I'm always funnier and better when I'm jet lagged. Um, so yeah, thank you, Pastor Tanner. 
It was an amazing, amazing conference, and our daughter's life has never been the same again. If you haven't registered for 2025, register. It's life-changing, and so thank you to all the team for sewing into our youth and young people. All right, well, we are in the middle of a leadership series today, and I want to share a leadership lesson from the life of Jesus. Who knows the best leadership lessons in life are caught, not taught? The best leaders, we, it's not what they say so much, it's how they act, it's what they model, it's the life they live. And in Matthew chapter 14, there are two back-to-back stories we're going to read. Um, I will just, if you're first time to church, the first story is a little gruesome, and the second one's a real fun one, okay? But they're back-to-back, and then, we will get, then, we'll, then we'll go from there. But the first one is the death of John the Baptist. What a happy way to start the service. Herod had arrested and imprisoned John as a favor to his wife, Herodias, the former wife of Herod's brother, Philip. John had been telling Herod, it is against God's law for you to marry her. Herod wanted to kill John, but he was afraid of a riot because all the people believed John was a prophet. But at a birthday party for Herod, Herodias' daughter performed a dance that greatly pleased him. We will not go into the details. So he promised with a vow to give her anything she wanted. At her mother's urging, the girl said, I want the head of John the Baptist on a tray. The king regretted what he'd said because of the vow he'd made in front of his guests. He issued the necessary orders. So John was beheaded in prison. His head was brought on a tray and given to the girl who took it to her mother. Later, John's disciples came came for his body and buried it. Then they went and told Jesus what had happened. Our second story goes into the start of Jesus feeding the 5,000. We're just going to read the first few verses. It says in verse 13, As Jesus soon uh, heard the news, he left in a boat to a remote area to be alone. But the crowds heard where he was and followed on foot from many towns. Jesus saw the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat, and he had compassion on them, and he healed the sick. Jesus goes on to feed 5,000 people that day. Back-to-back stories, and often if you're familiar with Scripture, we can just read these two stories, but we can miss something, which is the connection, the bridge between the two stories. It's not any bridge. There is a, a, an emotional bridge between these two stories. What hits me most about the feeding of the 5,000 wasn't actually the miracle of what God did, you know, you know, multiplying the bread. It was actually the timing of the miracle. At this particular time, Jesus was not in a good way. There are only five times in Scripture that Jesus shows any real emotion, and this was one of them. Why was that? Because John the Baptist and Jesus were cousins. They would have grown up together. Who, who hung around with your cousin growing up? Who knows that cousins have a, you have a bond with your cousin, you have a connection with your cousin that maybe you wouldn't have even with a friend? And so Jesus could well have grown up with John. They would have had childhood memories, built tree houses, hung out together. And John had baptized Jesus in the River Jordan just a few short months before. And it was a special time. I love it as a pastor if a dad or a mom comes to me and says, my daughter, my son is going to be baptized in a few weeks. Could I have the privilege to join you in the tank and baptize him? Because it's always special when family get involved with baptism. So Jesus and John had a strong emotional connection. John had a special place in the life of Jesus. And then... The Bible says that John has his head whipped off at a birthday party for the price of a dance. What a barbaric story. How brutal can can mankind be? In fact, it's one of the most brutal stories in the scripture. And it doesn't, he's not just been beheaded. The Bible says that they present John's head on a tray to Herod. And then there's a line here that I want to pick up on. It says, they went and told Jesus what had happened. They went and told Jesus what had happened. Can you imagine being on the receiving end of that phone call? A cousin who you loved, a cousin who you grew up with, and suddenly you hear the news that he's been beheaded without a crime. If any of us had heard that news or if our phone rang to be told us that a family member had been beheaded, we would be angry. 
We would be enraged. We would be probably feeling sick to our stomachs. We would be in shock. And Jesus was all God, but Jesus was also all man. So what does that tell me? He feels what we feel. So when they went and told Jesus what had happened, he would have felt anger. He would have felt emotion. He would have felt sick to his stomach that the person who he grew up with, who he loved, he'd lost. I think for many of us, our phones have rang or we've received an email and we've received the news that a loved one has passed away or a loved one has tragically been taken from us. Just give me a show of hands if you've been on the receiving end of losing a family member. So you know a little bit of what Jesus was feeling. And it says this, it says that as soon as Jesus had heard the news, he left alone on a boat to a remote place to be alone. His response was this, he wanted to be alone. When you've received some bad news, can anyone just, does anyone just wanna be alone? You just, you just want to try and get your feelings to yourself, process, kind of work through what you've heard. Yet a few short hours later, as we read in verse 14, Jesus is healing the sick and he is feeding 5,000 people. Can you see the connection between the two stories? And I think, if I'm honest, those 5,000 people in the field, they didn't really care about Jesus' emotions that day. They didn't really care about how Jesus necessarily felt. All they wanted was a good sermon and a good lunch. Yet Jesus was there emotionally low. And this is really a picture of leadership. This is a picture of the reality of life. Because often business, raising a family, Studying, pastoring, leading is tough or even brutal. And often life is simply a series of battles and blessings. For Jesus, it was a battle. For the crowd, it was a blessing. I want to talk for the next three and a half hours on battles and blessings. <laughs> Some guys sitting there going, yeah, that's good, that's fine. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm not going to speak for three and a half hours. Battles and blessings. Here's what serving Jesus looks like. You ready? Battles and blessings. Here's the blueprint of life. Battles and blessings. Emotional battles, physical battles, spiritual battles, mental battles, family battles, 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 battles. And there's going to be on time, times in life, in work, in study, in being married, where God requires of us of this which he modeled himself. And this is kind of the takeaway line I want us to hold on to this week. God requires of us to keep going about doing good even when we're feeling bad. Because Jesus that day was doing good when he was feeling bad. Imagine if Jesus had woken up the next morning and asked himself this question, how do I feel? Who thinks Jesus deserved a week off after that news? Who thinks he deserves some sick leave from work? Full pay. But the Bible says the next day he was healing the sick and he was feeding the multitudes. Why? Jesus went about doing good even when he was feeling bad. There's going to be times in life today, in life, that you're going to feel blessed. And if I'm honest today, I feel really blessed to be here. I absolutely love this church family. Chantelle and I feel more connected to this church than any church on the planet, and I say that wholeheartedly. I feel blessed to stand here and minister the word of God to you today. I feel blessed to eat at the Golden Corral last night. I felt blessed. <laughs> I feel blessed. And then they tell me Chick-fil-A shut today. <laughs> That's a battle. I feel blessed that the sun's out. My wife's feeling really blessed. She's a California girl who lives in England. She's enjoying just to see the sun. 
You, you think I'm joking, don't you? You guys live in this. I'm telling you, we live in the cold, the dark, and the rain seven months a year. So when we come here, trust me, we just feel blessed. And I mean that wholeheartedly. We feel blessed. I feel blessed today. I feel blessed. But life is not always like a blessing every day. Who just wished life was blessing to blessing? Life isn't like that. Jesus said himself, he said, in this world you will have. Where's all the Bible scholars? He didn't say in this world you will have blessing. He said in this world you will have trouble. So if you've recently become a Christian, and when you become a Christian, you thought all your troubles were going to disappear, that's not how it works. Jesus said, take heart. For I've overcome the world. What does that mean? He's going to walk with us for our battles. He's going to take hold of our hands as we walk through them together. And God requires of us to stay in the battle to get to the blessing. You know, so many people fall away from faith because they think the battle in their life is a, is a full stop. The battle you're facing right now is a comma, not a full stop. It is a setback. But God has a blessing on the other side of your battle. When Jesus woke up that morning and he was more, literally mourning the loss of his cousin, little did he know that one of the greatest miracles on the history of this earth was about to take place because he pushed past his feelings. Little did he know that. Who loves reading that story to your kids? Loads and fishes. I love reading that story. That story hinged on the fact that Jesus pushed past how he felt. Could there be miracles that we're yet to see if we're just able to push past some of the battles that we're facing? Are some of the greatest miracles on pause in our life and some of the greatest things on pause simply because our feelings are stopping us achieving them? Seven and a half years ago, we started out in the biggest battle of Chantal and I's life, which was to build our new church. And we had battle after battle. Started off as a seven million pound project. And then for the next seven years, all we did was fundraise against inflation. That's not fun. <laughs> so we had a war in our, we have a war right now in our, on our continent. We had COVID. I know some of you don't know what that was because you guys kind of just kept going anyway. I mean, it was like, <laughs> everyone's in COVID apart from Texas. Anyway, I will just say history will be kind to you guys. Anyway, we went through COVID as you watched on, and I bet the Golden Corral was open as well, wasn't it? Yeah. We were wearing golden masks, and you were in Golden Corral. Anyway, and material costs just went through the roof, and it was battle, a battle, 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 battle. And there were some days I just wanted to quit. Anyway, here's the miracle. God gave Chantal and I strength for every battle. On March the 2nd this year, your pastors, Joe and Laurie, they joined us as we opened our brand new church facility. Brand new church facility. Some of you, you're in the heat of the battle in business right now. You're in the heat of the battle in your, in, your, in your studies. And God has brought me here today from sunny Norwich to rainy Texas to encourage you to stay in the battle. Because if you can stay in the battle, there is a blessing on the other side. Jesus had every right. Jesus had every right to say to the crowds that day, I'm just needing to rest. I need to mourn. I need to stop. Yet he went about doing good. The feeding of the 5,000 hung on the fact that Jesus battled his feelings so that others could enjoy the blessing. Could it be today God wants to give us strength for the battle so other people can enjoy the blessing of what God wants to do through our lives? You know, Jesus, he never allowed his emotional life to dominate his spiritual life. So many times we allow our emotions. There are people today that should be in church, but the, the emotion of I'm just too tired, it's just too much, too hot, it's too cold, too busy. Emotions got in the way of people coming to church today. 
So many times we allow our emotional life to dominate us. I don't feel like reading my Bible. Well, welcome to the club. And I'm a pastor. I was on the plane yesterday from sunny London. And I was like, you know, you get to sit there for 12 hours and just watch movies. It's amazing. And then there's a little voice in my ear going, are you going to read your Bible? Are you going to talk to me? Are we going to have any time together in this 12 hours? I'm like, yeah, but you don't understand. This box set is so good. And I remember just taking my Bible. And this lady comes, this lady's sitting next to me. She goes, is that the Bible? I was like, yeah. She says, tell me all about it. <laughs> I'm like, I've got no choice. We are together for the next nine hours. <laughs> tell me all about it. I mean, what a, you know... So I got to explain the Bible to her. She was that's really cool. She says, I'm going to buy one. And so I'm just telling you that because I battled past my lethargicness, my rusty, sleepy head. And when I pulled out my Bible, it was a blessing for someone else. Sometimes we've got to push past our emotional life to help people enjoy their spiritual lives. So why am I speaking this message today? Because life doesn't always play along. In business, school, university, church, family, people will disappoint you. Life is painful. Our careers and our dreams, our plans don't always go the way we want them to go. And maybe we just need to stop asking ourselves this question. Are you ready? This is the question we need to stop asking ourselves. How do I feel? Because sometimes, how do I, if I'm honest, how did I feel this morning at 5.30 a.m. when my alarm went off? I mean, I didn't really feel it. I'm feeling it now, but I didn't really feel it at 5.30 a.m. And my wife is next to me. She gets to sleep in for an extra hour. I'm like, I didn't feel it. But we pushed all of us together. We pushed past the late sleeping, we push past a being. Who's enjoying the blessing of the church today? Just give me a wave if you're enjoying. Who's feeling blessed today? And so sometimes it's actually not about how I feel. I don't think Jesus felt like ministering to 5,000 people that day, but he was modeling a leadership principle. Keep doing good even when you're feeling bad. And there's going to be moments in our lives and seasons in our lives when God requires us to keep doing good even when we're feeling bad. It's called the call, the call of the kingdom. The question is, how do we go about doing good even when we're feeling bad? There's three principles here from this story that Jesus modeled. By the way, none of this is what Jesus taught. He modeled it. So these aren't principles I'm teaching. Jesus taught many principles, but he modeled these principles today in this leadership series. The first leadership principle that Jesus modeled is this. He went to the Father. It says in verse 13, as Jesus heard the news, he left in a boat to a remote area to be alone. Who was he being alone with? The Father. He got alone with his Father, not his feelings. Does anyone ever just love getting alone with their feelings? It's called isolation. There is a big difference between isolation and solitude. Solitude is when you get alone with God. Isolation is when you get alone with you. Can you see the difference? Jesus, in this season of of loss and mourning, he got alone with the Father. Isolation, if you're taking notes, is always dangerous. It's always dangerous. Nothing good can come from isolation. But when Jesus went alone, he went to be with the Father. Why did Jesus get alone? To tweet, to swipe, to wallow? No, to pray, to talk to his Father. When I've ever been disappointed, I'm always tempted to get alone with me instead of God. And I want to encourage you today, if you're struggling in the battles of life and all you want to do is watch box sets, eat Wendy's, sleep and swipe. I'm just being straight here today. You're isolating yourself. And God is calling you. And for some of you, you're watching online right now. 
and you've isolated yourself from community because of the battles in your mind, the battles in your family. Yet the call today in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Jesus is speaking. He says, come to me. Come to me. It doesn't say go to you. Come on, I'm going to say that again. It does not say go to you. It says come to me. All, all of us, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens or going through heavy battles, and I will give you rest. It doesn't say Netflix will give you rest. It says I will give you rest. So Jesus has lost his cousin in a barbaric fashion. And what does he do? He models this leadership principle to his disciples and to us in the 21st century. When we are going through the battles of life, the invitation is to come to me. God is calling us away from the distraction of life, the hurt, the pains, the battles, and he wants to speak to us. Notice it says this. It says he went and he left in a boat to a remote area, to a remote area. I'm going to put a question out to us. Do you have a remote area in life? A remote area. I'm not talking about the hustle and the bustle of life or quickly talk to God in the car on the way to, uh, to work. Do you have a remote space, a secret space, a place where you get to talk to God and he gets to talk to you? Our world is getting so, so disconnected from God. And I really want to challenge us, do you have a secret place? Psalm 91 says, he who dwells in the secret place of the most high. Do you have a place where you and God get to hang out? I wonder where your remote area is. If we're going to go the distance and the journey with our faith, we need a remote space. Some of you right now, you're burdened. You're carrying so much battle after battle. And God is calling you away from it all. When was the last time you downed tools and you just went to the river? You went to the lake and you just walked and you talked to God. And you told him how you're really feeling. You know, sometimes God is the only person who can handle how we're really feeling. Do you know our spouses can't always handle it? Sometimes we download on people and they just can't handle the pain, the problems, the battles. Yet Jesus is inviting And say, God, I just don't understand. My boss at work, he is a jerk. He treats me so bad. God, my mom is battling cancer right now. God, I don't know what to say. And God is saying, I can, I'm hearing you. I'm listening to you. I want to help you. Yet we blog about it on Facebook and we tweet about it and we Instagram about it. We tell everyone in the world who can't even help us. Because what we're really looking for is sympathy. But what we really, really need is help. And Jesus is the only one who can help us in our battles. Jesus went to the Father. The second leadership principle that Jesus modeled here is Jesus walked in his anointing. In that moment, Jesus would have remembered that he'd been anointed to do good. Luke 4, 18 says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me, to bring good news to the poor. Just like Jesus, we have been anointed. If you are a follower of Jesus, you have been anointed to keep doing good. We're anointed to keep doing good even when we're feeling bad. Notice it doesn't say the Spirit of the Lord is upon me for he's anointed me to bring good news to the poor when I'm feeling good. Because anyone can do good when you're feeling good. Anyone can be generous when your pockets are full. Anyone can give someone a hug when they're feeling happy. So if, if everything is lined up, I'm, I'm prepared to help. But what about being generous when you have next to nothing? What about giving someone a hug when you need one? Hang on. And Jesus remembered that over his baptism that he, would, he was anointed to do good even when he was feeling bad. The greatest moments I've felt the anointing, which, by the way, the anointing, if you're new to church, this is new language to, is simply the presence of Jesus living inside of us. And so the greatest moments have not been on a stage. They've actually been in times in life, in battles, when I felt like quitting. 2010, my dad died of cancer. One of the most painful moments of many of you have dealt with 
loss and pain. I dealt with it as a young man. 31 years old, my dad died, my pillar in my life. The biggest, biggest battle, yet I felt the presence of Jesus. I felt in that brokenness, God was using me. Do you know an egg can't be used till it's broken? And some of us, we're breaking right now, and we're going through the battles and the pains of life, and God is saying, if you can stay in the battle, I can use you. I remember 10 years ago, just over 10 years ago, July the 9th, 2014, Chantel and I, we were anointed to lead Soul Church. We had, our, we had hands placed upon us, and we were anointed to lead our church. Do you know what keeps me going on our tough days? That day. Because when I want to quit, I remember the day I was anointed to keep doing good. Because leading, if you're a leader in business, in church, in any organization, there are days you want to quit. Because people, in case you didn't realize, are mad. Come on. If you're going to be honest, be honest in church. People are mad. Not you lot. We're all the normal ones. Okay, we're all normal and everyone else, especially those 8.15 AMers. Okay, but you guys... You're the normal lot. And so on the days where I'm like, Chantal, I just don't know if I can do this anymore. People write things about you. They, you know, stop the clock. They send you emails. And when they send you emails, they go, dear Pastor John and Tell. And they always start like this. We really love you. And I'm like, yeah, they're leaving the church. (laughs) Is that right, Pastor Jim? If anyone ever sends you an email that says we really love you, it's like, you know what's coming. We really love you, but. And so that's my experience of battles and pains, and you have your experience, and we, share, we have this shared experience with battles and pains. But on my worst day leading the church, this is what I remember, I'm anointed to do it. God's anointing on Chantal and I does not change, even on its bad days. You're anointed to lead your family. All the men in this house, you're anointed to be the dad. All the mums, you're anointed. All the single parents, I want to tell you, you are anointed. You have a special anointing because you have to try and do so much. And you're anointed mums. You're amazing to raise your families. And I remind myself on the difficult days, the God who called me is the God who will keep me. The God who called you into that business is the God who will keep you. The God who called you into that marriage is the God who will keep you. The God who called you into that career is the God who will keep you in that career. Sometimes even Chantal and I, we're pastors, but we have challenging days in in our marriage because we're just human. Seem to me like this guy's really bearing his soul. We're just one of you. Okay, so what do I do on my tough days in marriage? I look at this. Do you know what this is? My wedding ring. When I was anointed in marriage. And the God who brought us together is the God who will keep us together. And so it's not about, do I feel like being married today? Because sometimes I don't feel like being married. (laughs) It's all right, she'll have her say one day. But you know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about? Some days you don't feel it. And the days you don't feel it, you have to fall back on your anointing. But the God who brought Chantel and I together in 2006 is the God who will keep us together because we made a covenant together. And so stop asking yourself, oh, I just don't feel it anymore. Welcome to the club. See, the anointing, the anointing, the power of the Holy Spirit, it gives us strength when we're weak. Gives us the power when ours has run out. Gives us the strength for today. The anointing, it sets us apart. The anointing gives you an extra gear. It gives you a new dimension. A few years ago, I was given a car. It was a Saab. Any Saab owners? There's very few of us left. (laughs) One there. You're anointed. (laughs) Very anointed. What's your name? David, yes, King David. <laughs> so I knew, I could tell he was anointed. Jackson, I could tell, I could tell. What an anointing. Anyway, I was given a Saab and I picked up my Saab and I was just over the moon of it. And as I was driving down the road, I saw a button on the, on the dash. It said S. I thought, an S button? What's that? Is that like a spiritual button? What does that do? Do you like to get raptured? You know, so I thought I'd take it out one night. Anyway, I pressed the S button. 
And what I realized is it was a supercharged button. And if you live in small places like I do and you get stuck behind small, slow-moving vehicles like tractors and combine harvesters, you need a supercharged button to get around them quickly. So you press the button, you get an extra few beats per minute or 1,000 revs per minute. I don't know all your language or you car people. But anyway, it get, makes the car go quicker. You know what I'm saying. He's, we've got one down here, yeah. <laughs> David knows exactly what I'm talking about. Anyway, I press this button and... Whew, you know, when I pressed that, I felt God speak to me. He said, that's exactly what my Holy Spirit can do. You can be going through life, and you're feeling just caught behind some battles and some challenges, and you can invite the Holy Spirit, the supercharged button of your life, and you can press that button, and God will give you something extra that you don't have in yourself. And I think that morning when Jesus woke up, when Jesus woke up, the Holy Spirit gave his son extra. He was anointed that day to do good even when he was feeling bad. And by the way, I'm not talking about gifting here. I'm not talking about getting up in your gifting. There is a difference between your gifting and the anointing. Let me explain. Your gifting is a gift. When you were born, gifts were placed inside of you. Leadership gifts, mantles, parenting gifts, gifts in business. There was gifts placed inside of you as a, as a young baby. And God will never, ever remove your gift. But the anointing is different. The anointing is what sets you apart. I'm not interested in coming up here in my gift. I can come up here in my gift and entertain you, make you laugh, we can have some fun. And your gifting will entertain people. You can be a worshiper and be gifted. You can play drums and be gifted. You can play, but when the anointing, the presence of Jesus comes upon you. See, the, the gifting and it, it entertains people, but the anointing transforms people. We live in a world right now, it's like we come to church, oh, what have you got for me? I haven't got anything for you. But the presence of Jesus, if it's flowing through me today, can hit exactly where you're going through. It can release the captives. It can bring hope into a desperate situation. You see, anyone can enjoy the blessing as the team come up, but who can endure the battle? So I want to encourage you today to walk in your anointing. Walk in your anointing. God anoints us for our, on our good days, for the days, our tough days. Jesus went to the Father. Jesus walked in his anointing. And number three, Jesus was moved with compassion. Verse 14, Jesus saw the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat, and he had compassion on them. Who agrees the last sight you want to see when you're mourning or you're going for a battle is people? I think the greatest invention of the 21st century is the ring doorbell. Do you remember the days before that where you'd have to open the door and hope? Hope it wasn't question mark because your hope is different to my hope. But, oh no, it's the neighbor, not that neighbor, the angry neighbor. But now with Ring Doorbell, what do we do? We just sit in our, uh, no, I'll just leave that one. I'll just, I'll just let that one slip. But you know, that morning when Jesus woke up, I think the last thing he wanted to see was people around his house. Because if he's anything like me when I'm mourning and going through pain, I don't want to be around people. I want to retreat. You ever walked into church feeling emotionally low and someone's just waiting for you? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? And you know what they want. They want to download on you. They want to tell you all their problems from the week and what their mother-in-law did to them and all those sort of fun things. God bless you if you're watching. That's my mother-in-law. You know, there's days when the last thing we need is other people's problems, pains, because we have enough of our own, don't we? We're trying to deal with our own battles. I'm going to be totally honest here because I've been honest this whole sermon, so we might as well finish off being honest. We have Mondays as our kind of Sabbath, Chantal and I and the kids. And a few, a few months ago, I was having a Monday, and uh, I don't like to speak to anyone on Monday apart from my wife and kids. I'm just like, just switch off. I'm like peopled out after a Sunday. Just, just, just have to have a rest. We went for a meal in a restaurant, and as we we're coming out, I see this, this, this individual from our church, and I literally ducked out of the way. 
Chantal was like, what are you doing? I was like, Chantal, I just don't want to talk to anyone. And she never tells me off, but sometimes her not saying anything is telling me off. Husbands, you know what I'm talking about? When they go quiet? Yeah, it was one of those moments. And so she walks over the road and she speaks to this individual, a very vulnerable guy. She just spends three or four minutes just talking to him and seeing how he is. She comes back, doesn't say anything. And that night I went home and I felt the Holy Spirit just really challenge me. That even when I was feeling bad, I had to continue to do good. And this is where this message came out of. It came out of this real life experience. And I went home and I said sorry to God, which is where this message was birthed. And I pray that we don't get so spiritually fat as a nation that we cannot get off our backsides to help someone and love someone. I pray that people still move us. I pray today that we're all in someone's crisis. Because if Jesus can be in someone's crisis that day, feeling the way he was, I think it was the greatest leadership lesson that he, he modeled for his disciples and for us. Because I realize this, if everyone cared for someone in Austin, everyone would be cared for. It says Jesus was moved with compassion. The verse should say that they were moved with compassion towards Jesus. But no, Jesus in his hour of torment, he was moved with compassion. I pray that we're still moved towards people. I pray that we're still moved we're not just part of this church, we're still moved by it. I pray when the, when the stories of the prison ministry came up and what God's doing in Mozambique and what God is doing for the incredible ministries of this church, I pray it still moves us. Oh, we're not just part of it, but it still moves us. We're still contributing to it. We still want to serve. We, still want to, we don't just want to tick that I've been to church today box, but it still moves us. If not, the Bible says... We're just a clanging symbol. You know, when we first became a Christian, I want to show you a graph of what happens when we become a Christian. In the first year of becoming a Christian, here's what we do. We tell an average 20 people about Jesus because we're moved by it. We're moved that God would save a wretch like me, that God's grace would be sufficient for me. We tell everyone at work what Jesus has released us from addiction. Come year eight, doesn't move us anymore we're still part of it but it doesn't move us that's a tragic graph because when we first came into church we wanted to tell everyone but what happens is the battles of life creep in familiarity creeps in and it's just like just one of them now and so many people have fallen out of love with church, with God, simply because of the battles. I wish life was a series of blessings, but it's not. And I'm going to finish with this, this question, to help us. Why would Jesus be so moved with compassion that day? Why? Why would he be so moved with compassion? even when he was facing his own battles? I think the answer is this. Because someone is always going through more than me. I think when Jesus looked out on that crowd that day, he saw a single mom battling to feed her children. He saw another parent who just lost their child. He saw someone maybe who'd been going through a terminal illness. And something got him out of bed that morning for him to be stirred with compassion. Because someone in our university, in our college, in our school, in our workplace is facing more than we're facing right now. The question is, will we allow the Spirit of God to keep moving us with compassion? Is anyone grateful that Jesus got out of bed that morning? Because that story has given hope to hundreds and hundreds of millions of people over the last 2,000 years. Jesus went about doing good even when he was feeling bad. It was the greatest leadership lesson that he modeled for his disciples and for us.
this week, we've got to go to the Father. We're going through the battles. What do we do? Principle number one, we go to the Father. Principle number two, we keep walking in our anointing. We're anointed for the bad days as well as the good. Principle number three, we've got to stay moved with compassion. Because someone is always going through something worse than we are. Today as you leave, maybe someone needs a hug on the way out. Maybe someone needs to be slipped $50 to say, hey, I know you're going through, it's tough right now. Here's $50 to help you with the grocery bill. Someone needs some compassion today. And if we all cared for someone, everyone would be cared for. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Would you stand to your feet? We're gonna keep going. We're gonna keep moving. Some days in life, it's a blessing. Others, it's a battle. None of us know what tomorrow may bring, but Jesus has given us a model, principles to live by for our days of battles. With every head bowed, every eye closed, you're saying, John, that message spoke to me today. I'm going through the battle. These leadership principles are gonna help me this week. The first one is to come to me. Just lift up your hand right now if God was speaking to you today. He was speaking to you. He went to the Father. Come to me, Jesus. He's inviting you this week. He didn't say come to church. He said come to me. A private invitation to a remote place to find rest in him. Find solitude this week. God is calling you away from isolation and he's calling you towards solitude. Time with him. He walked in his anointing. Keep walking in it. Even when you don't feel it, keep walking in it. People's lives depend on it. And God, I pray that you would move us with compassion. May we not be the statistic on that graph. Lord, I pray that you would use us this week to help someone in their crisis to help someone in their battle. I know we're battling our own thing and our own stuff, but God, in that, just as you modeled, you would help us be a blessing to those who are going through a battle. Even today, Lord, use us, Father God. Holy Spirit, use us. Help us to see with the eyes of compassion. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Yeah, come on, let's give God some praise. Right now, I want to pray for one more group of people. If you can, just stay in your seat. This is the most important part of the service. We really want to respect those who are yet to make a decision with Christ. But if you're saying today, Pastor John, I've heard that message and I've been going through so many battles, but I've been going through them alone. Today, you don't have to do life alone. We were not created to do life alone. We are created to go through life with our living Savior. And every single person who can hear my voice, both in person, in the room, and those online, this is an invitation to you to say, I want to receive Jesus as my personal Savior. Today, this invitation is open to you. He loves you. He's got a plan and a purpose for you. All you have to do is open up your heart to Him. He will come in and He will forgive your sins. He will give you a brand new new start. He will give you the strength to get through every battle that this life throws your way. So everyone who's in this room, if you can just close your eyes, we're going to give people a moment of privacy. You say, John, pray for me. I want to receive Jesus as my personal Savior all over this auditorium, online. Lift up your hand right now. Pray for me. Lift it up nice and high. God bless you. 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 Right at the back. God bless you. You can put your hands down. We're going to say this prayer out loud together. Father God, thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on a cross for me right now. I receive your love and forgiveness. I'm sorry for living life my own way. I pray that you would come into my heart, cleanse me with your precious blood, wash me clean from this day forward. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen, amen. God bless you, church.